Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Public Health on Call's first episode was released on March 3rd, 2020, when there were 1,922 documented cases of COVID-19 around the world, with just 21 known cases in the United States. One year later, more than 28 million people have tested positive in the U.S. The pandemic has killed nearly 500,000 Americans and more than 2.4 million people around the world. In over 260 episodes, we've brought evidence and experts to help unpack the day's COVID-19 and other public health news. This podcast has been downloaded over 4 million times in the last year, thanks to listeners like you. In recognition of the one-year anniversary of the podcast, Public Health on Call is going live. In addition to our regular episodes, you can join us for a live episode at 11 a.m. every morning starting Monday, March 1st through Friday, March 5th on the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health's Facebook page. We'll be talking to national leaders and experts on COVID vaccines, health equity, and mental health, and hearing from a top public health official about the state of the battle against the pandemic. We'll also be taking your questions from the comments for a special finale Q&A on Friday, March 5th. You can learn more about the full lineup at at Johns Hopkins SPH on Facebook, and be sure to tune in live for the first session on Monday, March 1st at 11 a.m. Today, I'm speaking to Dr. Hari Han, the inaugural director of the SNF Agora Institute and a professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Han studies American politics and specializes in the study of civic and political participation. Our topic is the intersection between the crisis of democracy and the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's listen. Dr. Han, thank you so much for joining me. I wanna start with this question. What do we mean when we say that democracy is in crisis? Well, first, let me just start by saying thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to have this conversation on such an important topic. Um, But to start with your first question about crisis, um, I mean, it's complicated to talk about because there are so many dimensions to the current crisis that we face. But I think I would put it largely into three large buckets. And here I'm focusing particularly on the United States, even though we're seeing some of these patterns in democracies all over the world. Um, But in the United States, we have there's you know, on on the institutional side of things, um, we have one political party that's grappling with anti-democratic forces within the party. And exactly what direction it's gonna take is is hard. And and that's really challenging because what ends up happening is that so much of our politics, so much of our politics and policymaking are governed through the political party system that when one party has anti-democratic forces within it, it's very hard to advance um, that basic work of government. So that's first. Second, we have an information ecosystem that, is operating at a speed and a scale that's different than any other um, information ecosystems that we've had in the past. And so what that means is that as disinformation floods the market, which by the way, is not a new thing, right? We've had yellow journalism at the turn of the 20th century. Like we've had disinformation be a part of politics um, for throughout our history, but it's never operated at the speed and the scale that we have right now. And I think um, dealing with that basic fact of misinformation and disinformation is one huge challenge. Um, that we face. And then the third, I think, is a basic crisis of legitimacy, which in, in that bucket, I would put the, um, the way in which the um, basic dysfunction of government, the polarization of political parties, and all these other forces and the, uh, the um, problems in the information ecosystem, the way it all come together to create a situation where government is not meeting the basic needs that people have. You know, it's when people are forced to choose between things like hunger and health, right, or childcare and their jobs or things like that, then 
what you have is a situation where more and more people feel like are feeling more and more precarious in their lives and government isn't able to solve the basic problems in our society. And so that leads to this crisis of, dis, dis, of legitimacy that has these tentacles that reach into so much of our public life. How much of the crisis of legitimacy that you're talking about relates to government actually not meeting the needs or just the perception or allegation that government can't be functional? And that leads people to think, well, there's nothing that I can do. So maybe they wouldn't even apply for programs, say, that could actually meet their needs. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's a combination of both, right? So there are certain situations where government really isn't solving big problems like climate change or sort of um, corroding infrastructure in the United States, you know, sort of things where we haven't really seen the kind of big um, policy deals that we need. And then there are situations like the ones where you point out where there are programs that actually could meet people's needs, but people's basic mistrust of government is leading them not to uh, take advantage of the systems that are there or leading you know, communities and, and local um, entities to not invest in the systems that are um, already in place. I was struck by what you said about this isn't our first go around with misinformation in politics. Um, do you think that it's sort of the combination of these three things that's unique now? Or what, if anything, makes this time, you know, more challenging than, than previous experiences with uh, crises in democracy? Yeah, you know, one of, um, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that um, there are ways in which the moment that we're in right now is not dissimilar to the turn of the 20th century. So if you think of the turn of the 20th century, that at the time was the highest period of pol- partisan polarization that we had, right? So you had the Republicans and, and Democrats were moving increasingly to polar extremes. We've exceeded that level of polarization. So we're talking, like, like, set the scene, the turn of the we're, 20th We're talking century. in the late 1890s, early 20th century, right? And what, hap- what ended up happening is that at the end of the 19th century, um, America was shifting from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy. You had increasing urbanization. People were migrating in different patterns. You had the rise of different urban centers around these industrial areas. Um, and so... Just like we have right now, where we're shifting in some ways from an industrial economy to a technological economy or an information economy, right? You have these, the shifts in the economy mean that certain people get displaced. That displacement creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, That leads to sort of different political parties are making arguments for different ways in which they want to tackle this moment of uncertainty. And that's leading to increasing polarization, which is the same thing that we saw at the turn of the 20th century. And and then you see the rise in the the early 20th century of of things like yellow journalism. This is Randolph Hearst and, you know, all the kind of stories that um, that emerged around around that moment and the rise of things like um, this is where the sort of discussion of should we. teach evolution in schools first began to come up. So some of the social issues about how do we think about the legitimacy of truth and knowledge in policymaking um, began to come onto the the political scene. So there are a lot of parallels to the moment that we have right now. I think what feels different is that right now, it's all of those things to a greater extreme, right? So it's not just the, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but the X number of people that were able to get the newspapers, you know, that were putting out false information. But now it's anyone who has a phone, access to a phone, Right. And they can meet all the other people and organize very quickly. And there's also the other thing that's different about the um, information ecosystem now is that you have you have um, distributed curation of knowledge that's happening. Right. So in the past, you still had newspaper editors who are still putting out false information, but it was a relatively limited number of sources, whereas now it's anyone, you know, with a login can put out information. And so you create that distributed these, this distributed information distribution system, which is enormously creative and wonderful in many, many ways and gives voice to voices that we haven't had in the past, but also makes us prone to all the um, problems of misinformation that we're seeing right now. Well, I'm going to ask you in a minute about whether there are any lessons from back then that might be applicable now. But before I do that, I want to add a little bit of a discussion of the pandemic. Sure. Because this crisis of democracy is happening at the same time as the worst public health catastrophe in a century. And uh, we're not out of it yet. And we've seen in the United States intersection of some of these uh, democratic challenges with um, the pandemic, with very strong political polarization around some of the responses to the pandemic. How do you look at the role of the pandemic? Is it sort of 
an interesting subplot? Is it central to the crisis in democracy? How, how do you think about the pandemic from, from your perspective? I mean, I think what the pandemic did is essentially is that um, it pressured the entire system in a way that exposed fault lines that may have been less visible in the past. And so it, it definitely increased the stress on the system so that disinformation all of a sudden became hugely problematic and being able to confront the challenge. Polarization became very problematic and being able to confront these these challenges. Um, but the other way that I think about it is that, you know, so if I'm if I'm an ordinary person that doesn't um, that isn't avidly connected to what's going on in politics and the news, right? The famous, there's a famous political scientist who said that, you know, politics is a mere sideshow in the circus of life, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my kids to school. I'm trying to take my job, like those sort of everyday things, right? Then, you know, the little bits of, of, of democracy that kind of float into my um, consciousness is one, I see, you know, all my, all the leaders fighting and bickering with each other all the time, right? Um, institutions that are, um, failing to to solve, to kind of get us out of this crisis in a way, right? I see lots of unclear facts and information. Like, I don't know who to trust anymore. You know, every no matter who I trust, someone tells me I shouldn't trust that person or trust that, that news source. Um, and I think that it's not... Um, and so what that does is that, that creates a lot of confusion on the ground, you know? And without the... Um, without trusted sources of information, credible sources of guidance um, in these moments, what you end up with is, is this is this sense of somewhat some chaos, I think, um, and, and divisiveness that we see around the pandemic. Are there flashpoints um, that are common around the world with the pandemic? Is, you know, we, we obviously have the, the mask issue in the United States. Um, there are big battles over closing businesses. Um, and we see parties line up in some places behind different positions on these. Is that a global phenomenon? Is that a U.S. phenomenon? Um, I mean, I think we've what we've seen all over the world is that there is enormous debate about how you set your priorities in addressing the many downstream consequences of this public health crisis that we're in. And different governments have made different choices about how to do that. But not, there's, you know, the short answer is there's no perfect formula out there, right? And so everyone's trying to figure out um, how to do what, what's best for the society that they're in. And different kinds of governments are sort of dealing with that crisis in different ways. And, you know, I've, I've read that there are certain countries where political parties have sort of put aside their differences to deal with the coronavirus. I mean, there's some pretty intense politics in countries around the world, but not all countries have politicized the pandemic in this way. And I wonder, does that tell us anything about how strong their democracy is? Does it tell us just something about how they think about public health? What do you make of the variation in country yeah, responses? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, like the, the, po the point about what you're saying that's so interesting is the idea of like, why did some countries politicize the pandemic and in other countries, it just became, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a problem that we have to solve. And we all just, we work together and we figure out how to solve it, right? We might disagree at the margins, but at the basic level, we're all trying to solve the problem together. Um, and I think the, um, the places like the United States where the pandemic really became politicized um, point to the... Um, challenges that emerge when you have political leaders that are able to exploit confusion on the ground, right? So we were talking before about the way in which there's, if I'm an ordinary person, there's all these sort of, there's all this chaos in my, in my, in my sense, right, of what's going on around things like the pandemic and, and stuff like that. And so that creates an opportunity for political leaders to be able to exploit that for partisan ends. And I think the places where we saw that happening were places where you had leaders that took that that had other incentives that, to be able to want to do that. Got it. And when they did that, how the whole system responded might reflect some uh, underlying uh, challenges that the democracy is facing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is, to me, this is the point about the sort of like what the pandemic did, is, did it, is it made visible challenges that already existed. So it's not like polarization wasn't there before, but the pandemic just heightened and gave us a visceral sense of what the consequences are of that kind of deep partisanship um, in, 
in our polity, right? Because it, it creates this incentive for exploitation. It creates an incentive for divisiveness. It creates an incentive to exploit problems, to um, turn them for partisan gain yes. um, in ways that aren't productive. The pandemic is a stress test for democracy, in other words. The pandemic is absolutely a stress test for democracy. And I think we're still in it. So that um, may imply that if we can strengthen our democracy, we can strengthen our response to the pandemic in some places. Um, how do you think about what's necessary at this moment to you know, quiet the crisis that we're facing? Yeah, you know, I mean, what people, you know, like, I think, you know, they say it's Winston Churchill. I'm not sure if this is the right tip, but, you know, he always said that democracy is the best of the worst options out there, right? Or Tocqueville's kind of famous line is that it's not that democracy sort of has some kind of genius baked into it, but the whole point of democracy is that's a self-correcting system, right? And so that's the hope is that if we can return democracy's ability to self-correct for the kind of problems that we're talking about, then, you know, it should help us better solve the, the pandemic. Um, and so when I think about like, what are the things that we need to do? To me, the question is, how do we reduce that sense of chaos and mistrust among the public, right? To, to reduce things like vaccine hesitancy, to sort of like, you know, begin to get public engagement on the things that we need to be able to get ourselves out of the crisis that we're in. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, this is a little bit of, I, I hope this isn't a tangent, but I think it's relevant is, so I've been doing a lot of research on um, uh, like evangelical mega churches. And so these are churches in the United States that are working in relatively conservative populations. Um, you know, one of the ones that I'm working with, that I know best has 40, draws 40,000 people per week to its services. And so, this is pre-pandemic. They are drawing 40,000 people a week in person. They have a much bigger audience now that they've gone online. So they had this enormous reach into populations that are prone to things like vaccine hesitancy and mistrust and disinformation um, and so on and so forth. And the ones that have been effective, I think, in being honest, bro uh, trusted brokers in these moments are ones that um, I think there's sort of like two characteristics that kind of emerge. So one is, and then now I'm drawing on a little bit of language from the churches themselves, is they have this idea that you belong before you believe. Right. So the idea is, is that you are a part of our community and we welcome you, whoever you are, regardless of what you believe. You might you might believe in God. You might not believe in God. Right. You could be pro-Trump. You could be anti-Trump. You could believe in vaccines. You can reject vaccines. Whoever you are, you're a part of who we are and we welcome you. And they draw people into that sense of belongingness in a way that sort of allows them to become trusted messengers. Right. And then the second thing is, is, well, so then how do they hold all those tensions? Like, how do they hold people who disagree with each other together in this one institution, right? Like how do you get anti-Trump and pro-Trump people to attend one church together? And what's really interesting is that a lot of these huge churches, like a 40,000 person church will have a cellular structure, right? So that everyone is connected into these smaller groups so that even if they disagree with, with what the large church is doing, there's a venue in which they are known and they have voice. You know, and so that kind of cellular structure, what it does is it gives the church itself this ability to be pliable in the, you know, like a tree in the wind, like an aspen in the wind, essentially, so that as these external shocks come, as pressures are put on the system that sort of stress the disagreements that exist among people, um, they have the trust and the flexibility to be able to sort of move within that. And so what, it, what, so what does that mean? So to me, when I think about that, like I think, well, that's what we want to try to rep begin to replicate on a larger and larger scale, right? Because for so many people right now, there it's kind of like politics feels like it's locked in this rule or die mentality, right? If my people aren't in office, then I'm just going to get crushed by the other side. So like it's game over, right? And that's true on the left and the right. I think yeah, we have do, that set. Do you think that, you know, some of the recuperation can be done at the local level? Or yeah, is, absolutely. is this... Is this yeah mainly a national conversation. Oh, no, I think it's a federated conversation, right? So the whole point is that it has to be, you ha in order to get that kind of pliability and that cellular structure that we're talking about, it's like you have to have these like nested triangle, nested circles almost of, you know, local work that's nested in, in, in state work that's nested in um, national work. Because, right. then, you know, the, the national structure provides a kind of strategic direction that's needed, right? But the local structure has a kind of connectedness that the national structure can't have. Got it. And and any lessons from the turn of the last century, do you think? Or 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 any insights at least? 
Um, yeah, there's a great book by a sociologist named Elizabeth Clemens who talks about um, where she looks at the progressive era, which is essentially like the progressive era reforms were a lot of what got the country out of that moment of polarization and mistrust that we were in the, t- the 20th century. And what she talks about is how were, how was it that groups like women's groups, you know, who didn't even have the vote at the time, were able to change the very rules of the game by which the game was played and restructure the entire system. Um, and what she finds is that it's groups that were able to play, that were able to kind of be both inside and outside at the same time, right? They were grounded in um, constituencies and people who wanted to see change happen, but they were able, but they structured themselves, for example, after business lobbies. And so she tells these great stories, for example, of legislators who are like, pick up the phone and they're like, you won't believe it, but there's like a woman in my office and she's like lobbying for things, you know, <laughs> like unheard of um, at the time. But the women knew that if they kind of structured themselves and behaved as business lobbyists did in the guild, first gilded age of the late 19th century, mm-hmm. then elected officials would know how to negotiate with them. And so it was that ability to do both of those things simultaneously that shifted the system. You know, that time period is the origin of a lot of important um, steps forward in public health. Oh, I didn't know that actually. Yeah, the, the progressive era is when the first major um, investments to save the lives of newborns started, for example. Um, and a lot of the organization at that time uh, was intended to um, to address uh, preventable causes, particularly of child mortality. Um, and there was legislation to that effect. There were national associations to that effect. There, uh, we actually are going to explore this in another podcast, um, including some of the uh, underside of that effort, I'll just say, but um, but very much um, the fact that those efforts were successful did in fact give people more confidence that some of these challenges of society could be overcome. Kind of in yeah. your in that thir- third area, the oh, rate of death of babies dropped dramatically. Um, right. And things that people thought were unavoidable became uh, things that people expected to prevent. And, and uh, public health played a really important role in that. Yeah, so that same period in Progressive Era, not only do we see the rise of these public health measures that you're describing, but also that's where a lot of the basic features of democracy as we understand it now came up. So that was the first time that we passed a constitutional amendment to allow for direct election of senators. Um, People used to not be able to elect their senators directly. Um, That's where we adopted the um, Australian ballot, which is the kind of ballot that we use now when we go to vote. And the secret, you know, the whole notion of the secret ballot kind of emerged um, in that moment, um, you know, obviously there was a um, fight for suffrage um, around that time, you know, which sort of took several iterations, but, um, you know, it, it, for, it at least expanded the vote to white women. And so we saw a, a, a broad range of reforms emerging in that moment. And I think that's the kind of moment that we need right now in the 21st century. Hari Han, thank you so much for joining me to talk about democracy and the pandemic. It was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.